Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. And on this episode, I've got an introduction to the Ninth Amendment, which reads, The enumeration in the Constitution, I've got to read this, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Most people either totally ignore this amendment in the Bill of Rights or they totally misunderstand it. So I've got some essential history so we can understand its original legal meaning in the Constitution. I've got some insight from people like James Madison, James Wilson, Richard Henry Lee, and others. And I hope you guys will find this both interesting and educational. But first of all, I do want to thank you for spending some of your time with me today. Whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, I can't thank you enough. And while we allow people another minute or so to get notifications to join us on the live stream, a uh, quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. I appreciate you being here. There's Missouri Freedom Initiative. Good to see you. And I hope the live stream went well. I got to catch up on that one from yesterday. Cheriton Farmer, Liberty Revolutionary, Dave Simmons. All in Missouri. Oh, no, Dave Simmons, I'm not sure where you are, but everybody else is in Missouri, it seems like. Uh, Leah Tanya King, Haji54 in Oakland County, Sharon in SoCal, my neighbor. Mad Mom Anon 2, I like that. Hunters F770 over on Twitch. Thank you for watching us over on that platform as well. Uh, let's get right to this. I want to start out again. I got to read this off to you because I don't have it memorized like the Tenth Amendment, but it's a really important one. We'll start out with the Ninth Amendment, if I can pull it up on the screen here. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And here from an article by Mike Meharry we published a few years ago, he says, generally Americans treat the Ninth Amendment like the uh, Bill of Rights' unwanted stepchild. They mostly ignore it, and when they do talk about it, they often misunderstand it. In reality, he writes, the Ninth Amendment serves a very simple but crucial purpose. It expands the limits on the federal government. Expands the limits on the federal government, not expands the power. A lot of people want to tell us that it's basically an expansion of power, but it's really an expansion on the limits of the power of the federal government. I'm getting told that the stream is not going out over to um, YouTube for some reason, but I'm recording here, so I'll upload later if needed. Anyway, so it's an expansion on the limits. It was designed to work as a partner with the Tenth Amendment to reinforce these structural limits on federal power. Here's how Mike put it in an article that we published this week. Like the Tenth Amendment, the Ninth is a rule of construction. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments add nothing at all to the Constitution, and they don't take anything away. They merely tell readers how to interpret the document. In other words, it tells us how to construe. It's a rule of construction, how to construe the powers delegated to the federal government and the limits on those powers. That's an important note. Here from Rob Nadelson. And this is, so we have to understand what the original document unamended was intended, what the concerns were, and then why they added the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. And here's how Rob puts it. The original Constitution con contained three types of restrictions on federal power. One, the Constitution listed things the government could not do. For example, pass an ex post facto law. Two, they enumerated, the Constitution enumerated the powers the government was supposed to have. For example, regul regulate interstate commerce, but not agriculture. And then three, the Constitution included specific restrictions on specific powers, like Congress could appropriate money for an army, but only for a two-year period. So these are three restrictions on federal power. But people were concerned that if you added a Bill of Rights, you added things like the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, it would actually screw up what that intended uh, setup was. And here's how Rob puts it. Some argued that type one, the list of things that it could not do, should be expanded with a Bill of Rights. They wanted further restrictions on federal power. But others, James Madison included, and James Madison is really who we look to as the primary drafter of the Ninth, pointed to a risk in that proposal. If you add this, it could be great, but it could be very risky. The concern was this. Because of the legal maxim, and this is Latin, so I'm going to get it really bad, designatio 
unius est exclusio alterius. The designation of one thing implies the exclusion of another. They thought that maybe adding a Bill of Rights might encourage people to disregard the type and two and type three restrictions on federal power. So basically see it upside down. James Wilson, I think, probably gave the best ex explanation of this particular problem here from a speech in the, the Pennsylvania ratifying convention in November of 1787. He says, in all societies, there are many powers and rights which cannot be particularly enumerated. A bill of rights annexed to a constitution is an enumeration of the powers reserved. If we attempt an enumeration, everything that is not enumerated is presumed to be given. The consequence is that an imperfect enumeration would throw all implied power into the scale of the government and the rights of the people would be rendered incomplete. So they were concerned that, OK, we've got this uh, delegated and reserve power set up. And if we say, you know, OK, there's this uh, this Bill of Rights, then people are going to think, well, that's all you have. Uh, these are the listing and everything else is cut off. And so Alexander Hamilton actually even was on that side as well. He said that adding a list of restrictions on federal power would be dangerous because it might be read to imply uh, that other basically otherwise unlimited congressional authority. And in a weird way, I hate to say it, they've both been kind of proven to be correct uh, because that's basically how people see it these days. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have people like Richard Henry Lee, who's on September 27th. 1787, he made a motion in the Confederation Congress to include amendments and basically a Bill of Rights before even sending the document to the states for consideration of ratification. And this is from Melanchthon Smith's notes in the Confederation Congress. He says, no power should be exercised, but such as expressly given, and therefore no constructive power can be exercised. To prevent this is the great use of a Bill of Rights. I covered this history behind the Bill of Rights, the untold story of why it exists in an episode last December on Bill of Rights Day, December 15, 2021. I will link to that in the show notes. And speaking of the show notes, I should mention that uh, if you want to be able to read the stuff that I'm talking about, listen to that other episode, etc., you got to follow us over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty, all spelled out. 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty. On each individual episode, I publish a blog post that includes all the platforms are on, both video and audio only podcast edition. I appreciate all the likes and the comments and the reviews on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere. You can also find the links that I'm mentioning. There's a show notes section for each episode and even our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Uh, back to Rob Nadelson. He says when a demand, when the demand, so they had this debate, uh, Richard Henry Lee did not win out on getting a Bill of Rights attached. Uh, so they went to the ratification debates and there was a lot of uh, effort to make sure that there were going to be no amendments. But at, after a amount of time, uh, there was some proposals. They couldn't get it ratified in Massachusetts, for example, without recommended amendments. So that was the deal that they made. OK, we're going to ratify it as is, but we're going to make a promise that they're going to add amendments. And they didn't actually follow through on it really quickly, but uh, they eventually did after some pressure from people like Richard Henry Lee, Elbridge Jerry, Samuel Adams and others. But anyways, Rob writes it this way. When the demand for a Bill of Rights prevailed, Madison agreed to draft one. But he included what became the Ninth Amendment to make clear that expanding the type one restriction on government did not mean abandoning type two or three. In other words, it was going to reaffirm the structure of the government as intended in the first place before amendments were added and make clear that it was going to be a government of limited delegated powers with everything reserved to the states the, or the people or the people of the several states. Here's how James Madison addressed this particular concern and explaining why he eventually included the Ninth Amendment in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, October 17th, 1788. He says, my own opinion has always been in favor of a Bill of Rights. Madison historians would be able to tell me if this was a flip flop or not. He did some, just like all, all politicians. My own opinion has always been in favor of a Bill of Rights, provided it be so framed as not to imply powers not meant to be included 
in the enumeration. So that was how James Madison put it. And then here from Kurt Lash, on June 8th, 1789, James Madison then submitted to the House of Representatives, Representatives a list of proposed amendments to the Constitution. I think it was a total of 12. The 9th and 10th were the 11th and 12th. In his accompanying speech, Madison acknowledged Hamilton's warning. So he recognized that Hamilton's warning was there about adding a list of rights, but insisted he had, quote, guarded against such a dangerous implied expansion of federal power. Hamilton, actually, for the guy who was warning against implied powers, he sure flipped the switch just a couple of years later in 1791 and said there were all kinds of implied powers. But uh, Madison said he was guarding against this specifically, guarded against by proposing, quote, the last clause of the fourth resolution. And he explained this. Let me see which one I've got here. Oh, and then he explained the meaning of the Ninth Amendment uh, further in another speech that he gave against the First Bank in 1791 after it, uh, after it had been sent to the states for ratification. This is February 1791, 10 months before uh, the Bill of Rights Day. Bill of Rights was added. And here he was arguing against Hamilton's First Bank, who was really basing it on implied powers, which was different before. Suddenly, all of a sudden, he found all kinds of implied powers. So here from his speech, February 2nd, 1791, Madison then read several of the articles proposed, remarking particularly on the 11th and 12th, that's the 9th and 10th Amendment, the former as guarding against a latitude of interpretation, the latter as excluding every source of power not within the Constitution itself. So partners, 9th and 10th Amendment working together as partners to restrict federal power, to ensure that the federal government was that of uh, limited de delegated powers. And here we go from uh, Kurt Lash. He says, the Ninth declares that just because the Bill of Rights lists some constraints on federal power, this may not be construed to imply that federal power is not otherwise unconstrained. So just because they have some limits, that doesn't mean that those are all the limits on federal power. They're limited in everything else that's not mentioned automatically. The Tenth Amendment then further declares that all power not properly construed as falling within those enumerated powers are reserved to the people in the states. Significantly, Kurt writes, both the Ninth and the Tenth Use the language of popular sovereignty. And if you've been watching or listening to this show for a while, you hear me often talk about sovereignty, final authority. In the American system, final authority is not in the hands of any government. They oppose that. They fought a long, bloody revolution, a war for freedom, for independence, against a system where sovereignty, the final authority, was in the hands of government. And that's the way it always was, whether it was a single person or a group of people, king, a queen, a, uh, an oligarchy, whatever it may be. And for the American system, sovereignty was always with the people of the several states, that final authority, not state government, not the federal government, no government at all. So this was a language of popular sovereignty. It's the people's right. And Kurt highlights people's right. It's the people's right to create a national government of limited power, or a general government would be a better phrase for it, and reserve all non-delegated powers and rights to the people in the states. Now, St. George Tucker, in his view of the Constitution of the United States, 1803, he basically echoed James Madison. He was the top legal mind of the time, writing the first long uh, overview of the legal meaning of the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson bought copies and gave it to his entire cabinet, from my understanding, but he thought it was a very important book as well. And it was really the leading uh, authority on the legal meaning of the Constitution for the first couple of decades there. So he echoed James Madison's understanding that the Ninth worked in tandem with the Tenth to preserve the rights of local self-government. So he's talking about the Ninth and Tenth, saying what they are. And then he says, the sum of all, which appears to be that the powers delegated to the federal government are in all cases to receive the most strict construction that the instrument will bear, where the rights of a state or of the people, either collectively or individually, may be drawn into question. I think Lash sums it up best. He said the Ninth Amendment guarantees, again, the right of local self-government to be able to make decisions in your own area, on your own time, on your own issues, recognizing that in a large country, large union of states, there is a wide range 
of political, religious, economic, and social viewpoints. And the only way that people can live together in peace is to allow them to have their own way in their own area, whether you love the way they do it or not. The way we have things today is totally opposite. It's basically a one-size-fits-all solution on almost anything and everything for hundreds of millions of people, and that only guarantees that people slide into factions, my team right or wrong versus your team right or wrong. And every few years, we've got one side versus the other trying to control the entire apparatus and destroy the other side. And this is exactly the opposite of what the founding system left for us. The Ninth Amendment, Kurt writes, guarantees the right of local self-government in all matters not expressly prohibited to the states or clearly delegated to the federal government. And as James Madison, the ninth works, James Madison told us, the ninth works in tandem with the tenth to prevent the national government from interfering with matters constitutionally reserved to the people in the states. I like calling, I mean, it is a national government today. I like referring to it as the founding generation did, which is a general government. Well, I hope you guys, um, oh, yeah, I guess uh, definitely seen. Definitely seen on uh, the live chat that uh, not streaming out there for some reason, but I am recording it locally. So whatever platform you may have been waiting for, on, hopefully you'll be seeing this in the upload shortly. I don't have an opportunity to answer any questions, which I was hoping to do. But if you do have some questions that you want to ask, please leave them in the comments, uh, whether I guess live or later on in the archive is more likely. Or you can email me at team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Again, team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Uh, don't forget, if you support the work we're doing, you support the show, you like helping us get this message out to more people, you can help us out a great deal for as little as two bucks a month by becoming a member today over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.